here is, uh, I think we printed 75 of these. We can print some more. But um, I, uh, I did some research. So let me just start out by saying this. Some of you got this. and wonder, what would you put this out for. I, uh, I did some personal research. You know, um, last year, I think it was March 11th or 12th, I've said this many times, um, I was praying uh, before the COVID-19 crisis hit, and, uh, and, and I was minding my own business, not thinking honestly about a thing, and a word floated up inside of me, and the word was nefarious. I thought, why am I, I don't even use that word. What is that? I looked it up, and uh, anyway, I've talked about that over the last year a few times, but uh, it had to do with COVID-19 and and how it, how it changed the world and what we're living with now. And uh, so um, I, uh, I started doing some research on, on things. And, and last year was an uncanny year in that, in that uh, a one-sided narrative began to emerge in lots of ways uh, in the media, on, in online things. And if, you're, if what you said didn't fit uh, the purposes of an online narrative, it was taken down. How many have realized that? Now, I don't know about you, but that bothers me very deeply. Um, we have freedom of expression in the United States still. Some nations won't let you say what you think, but thank God we've been able to do that heretofore, but now that's been hindered. So the issue for me was, why are they not allowing some people to say what they think and believe? Now, that bothers me. It should bother you. Would you want somebody to put a, put a muzzle in my mouth and say, you can't preach that because we don't like it? I'm going to do it anyway. Right? So uh, anyway, said all that and I'm taking too long on this, but I, I put out a, I made this up last Wednesday afternoon after doing a lot of thinking. It took me a lot of time to do the research. And what this is, is uh, since the narrative about the vaccines and COVID-19 are one-sided, I'm not kidding. In fact, I've tried to post things that I have, that I have seen. I've tried to post it on Facebook. Uh, YouTube does the same thing. Uh, Instagram does the same thing as, as well as Twitter. And it's really hard to find an online, online place that will allow uh, differing ideas. You know, the strength of any organization is the fact you've got people around you whose ideas differ than yours or different than yours. How many know that's true? If you want everybody to think the same way, you've got a problem. Right? So we got a problem in America. So anyway, I put this out because, uh, and they're 15, uh, they're both uh, 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 printed matter as well as videos. I've got 15 and uh, I listed them by title and there are URLs here if you go online. This is available online. On the front there's a place where you can scan this, put your phone up to it, scan it, your little thing comes up at the top, click it and it goes right to the notes and we have the instructions right on here. But I want you to click on these articles and these, uh, these articles and videos that I've placed on here. There's some very, very smart people worldwide whose uh, opinions and thoughts are being stymied. And something's wrong with that. And, and you say, well, why? I've not said a word about any of this. I've not said a word publicly until last Wednesday night. But my heart got to, you know, disturbing me. And I got to thinking, well... You know, to him that knows to do good, James 4, 17 says, he that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it's sin. Now that, that hit me between the eyes. All, well, then, then Lord, am I withholding what I know from people that might help them? And the obvious answer was yes. So, okay, so here it is. So, so if you like, maybe you like this, maybe you don't. Personally, I'm good with whether you like it or whether you don't like it. I'm cool. You cool with me? I'm cool with you. So, um, the other thing that I have on here is uh, scriptures, scriptures that build your faith for health and healing is on the last part of this sheet. And the, I've honestly, I mean, uh, for the last almost 45 years, these are things I, I met. In fact, I, got, I woke up last night at 3 o'clock. The devil attacked my body last night at 3 o'clock. I went through every one of those scriptures. That is on this sheet. I mean, because I've got them inside of me. And, uh, you know, it just, it just helps you. So this, this sheet is available. This is also available online. And uh, that's our preference. You get it online so you can, you can go to the information. Is that okay? And then you make your sound choices. And when you make your choices based on facts, then you know what? We can always do well, right? And, and, and in obedience to what the Lord's saying, right? So I've been talking to you about healing belongs to you. In Christ, this is part seven, a teaching series. So here we are, uh, lesson seven on healing. Belo uh, healing belongs to you in Christ. This is how to receive your healing by faith. Let me just say, I'm not going to get done today 
I've got uh, seven points. I won't get to all seven. In fact, I'm going to slow her down pretty quick here and just, just idle my motor. And we, can, we go, can we slow down? And so just come back next Sunday if I don't get through with my notes today because I've got a lot I want to share. And let me just say this, uh, this issue with healing. This is not something that, well, Pastor Mitch just studied something. Give, no, no, no. This is how I live. Now, if you want to know something about me, what I'm talking about, this is how I live my life. I've been living my life over four decades this way. And, and am I perfect at it? Well, no, I'm not perfect at anything. But, you know, this is my heart. And this is where I'm going with my life. So I want to help you. And what's helped me, I believe, will also help you. And the facts are we have spent uh, the past six lessons laying a foundation uh, of the fact that healing is the will of God for the believer. It's as, it's as much God's will to heal you as it is to save you. Now, here's the question. Does everybody, is everybody saved? Uh, why? Why? I heard word choice. What else? Yeah. Uh, so um, even though even though salvation is is God's will for every person, not every person receives because they have to do something about it themselves. And so it's the same way with the divine healing. Healing is the will of God, but you've got to put yourself in the place to be able to receive what God has provided. Right. It's the same way with salvation. Listen, I've, I've had people talk to me through the years. I knew the conviction of the Holy Spirit was on them. I knew the person didn't know Jesus as Lord. I know they needed him. They felt, they told me they wanted him, but they weren't ready to make the choice. And, and I've, I've met a few people that I don't think made the choice before they died. I can't judge them. Maybe, maybe the last five seconds I said, Jesus, help me. Maybe so like the thief on the cross. I hope they did. You hear what I'm saying? So it's an individual thing. Nonetheless, we have a part to play. God has a part to play. So today I want to begin looking uh, practically at how uh, we can receive healing by faith in Jesus' sacrifice. I've said this every week, and I don't want to miss this week. There will never be a time in your life that you don't need faith in God for healing, either for yourself or for someone else. Yes or no? I mean, I got four children, eight grandchildren, and and, uh, you know, what am I doing? And, and, and four, you know, daughter-in-laws or son-in-laws or whatever, you know. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm always believing God for something, right? And then between me and Susan, and as you age, how many know you better believe God for your physical body? Yes or no? So I'm preparing myself to live a long time. How about you? And if you're going to do that, you need to, you need to prepare your faith. And faith is not something you had yesterday and think, well, I just pulled that out the closet. It's got to be current right now. If it's not right now, it's not faith. And if you're not believing right now, it doesn't work. It's not yesterday, it's what you got today that counts, right? So anyway, we've talked about dealing with fear. We've talked about uh, changing the environment of your life. We've talked about seven ways you can know uh, that it's God's will to heal you. We've talked about the healing covenant that God made with the Israelites in, in the book of Exodus after they came out of Egypt through the Red Sea. Uh, we took a week and talked about seven God's seven covenant ch- names. God never changes. Uh, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. And then last time, and, and let me, I hadn't even said a word. Thank you, Cameron. He spoke for me last week. Give Cameron a hand. He knocked it out of the park. So thank you. Praise God. We got some good people here, don't you think? Anyway, and so week before that, I uh, I talked about healing in the atonement of Christ. And and if you haven't heard some of these, go back on the website and listen. We put all of the notes and the... uh, and the video and audio, and we have podcasts on these, so you can just drive down the road, listen to it. For me, I just keep hearing the thing, same things over and over and over. Are you like me? I've got a leaking problem, and I forget the things I heard, and I got to remember. You say, well, how do you remember so much? I just read it over and 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 over. And finally, it kind of something registers, right? So if you do that and work on it, you'll be amazed how the Lord can help you. Anyway, today, seven points on how to receive healing by faith. Uh, we'll see how far we get today. God usually adds to what I'm saying, and he's already started doing it this morning. So number one, anything received from God must be received by faith. Yes or no? Now, that's a fundamental throughout Scripture. In fact, in fact uh, God called Abram, later called, changed his name to Abraham, uh, he was from a, a pagan culture. Um, his his uh, uh, ancestors' parents worshipped the moon god, and uh, and God called Abram out of from his family, and said, "Abram, I'm going to do something different with you. 
In you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. You're going to have more children than you can even count. Look at the stars. Look at the sand. You're going to have more children than you can ever count. And he was childless and he was 75 when God called him. And his wife was 65, well past childbearing years. So at age 100 and age 90, Sarah and Abraham, that God changed his name from exalted father Abram to, to father of a multitude, Abraham. So every time he spoke his name, what's your name? Abraham. Where's your children? Uh, they're coming. He's an old man and his wife uh, should be a grandma but has no children. And it was a curse during the time, that time uh, and that culture not to have children. It's like you're not blessed, something's wrong. And so age 100, age 90, they had children. And God, the Bible calls Abraham the father of faith. Did you hear me? He's the first person. It says Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. I love that. I don't know about you. Uh, Abraham had a bad past. He, he didn't come from blue blood family. He come from a heathen family. But God saw that he would believe with his heart what he, he said about, about him. And it changed Abraham's life. You know what? God has given you and me the faith of Abraham. That's the faith that can believe when it looks like it's not working. Abraham and Sarah had to believe for 25 years. Can you imagine that? And they're getting older by the second. 75, 76, 77 was Abraham. Sarah's 70, uh, 65, 70, 75. 80, the years are clicking by. God said, you're going to have a baby. 80, 85 is, is Sarah. You know, <laughs> Abraham's 90, 95. Well, that's what you said, God, and they're not getting any younger. Huh? A hundred years old was Abraham. Sarah's 90 and had a baby. How would you like to have a baby that old? That'd be like me and Susan having another child. Give me a break, right? I'd be in my 80s when he gets out of high school, right? That's different, right? You like that? Huh? Now, some people, you know, sometimes things happen. Nonetheless, I just said that. Faith is the way you receive from God. And we've got it all mixed up today, and I've got to slow down, and I'm not, we'll see how far I get. But I've got to say this. Today, we magnify the love of God. And you know what? Probably the one thing that uh, makes me weep, I'm more grateful in my own life than anything, is that God loves me. Aren't you glad that he loves you? But, but I also know that just because God loves me doesn't mean that I'm going to get God's best that he has for me. And we see what people have mistakenly thought today, well, God loves me, that means I'm going to get his best. No, it doesn't. You know, I've been teaching through the book of Revelation on Wednesday nights. We'll go to Revelation 21. All things being equal this coming Wednesday night. The last time I spoke, Wednesday, a, a week ago on the subject, you know, here we are at the great white throne judgment where all unbelievers are standing before God and the books were opened. And another book is opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by those things written in the books, that is the book of works, according to what they had done. You know, I couldn't help but think as I was studying that, Here's God sitting on a great big throne. Here's all the people of the world. All of the people of the world that died without Christ. And God, does God love every single one of those? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. In fact, Amplified says, God so deeply loved and prized the world. Wow. When he looks at you, that's my boy, that's my girl. I love you. Do you know he feels that way about you? Even when you don't like yourself, God looks at you and says, I love you. Even when you mess up, God says, I love you. I was thinking about that and thinking about the great white throne judgment. That is the, that's the, here, the sentencing phase for eternity for those that die without Christ. And here's God sitting on his throne. I'm making a point, and he's looking at the person. And nobody's saying anything. Maybe God has a very somber face. He's looking, they're looking, they're standing before God, each individual. 
Angels, what do you find? I'm looking at the book of works, sir. What have you found? Do their works stack up to the righteousness of God that is right standing with me? Can they even enter heaven based on what they've done? Sir, I don't see that it equates with who you are and your character, sir. And see, God loves that person. And he has to look at every individual that dies without Christ with eyes of love. And God has to say, depart from me, you that work iniquity. Into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And the Bible says hell and death were cast into the lake of fire. Question, did God love those people? You're sitting here and you're messing around in sin. Does God love you? This is, these are some big, I didn't know I was going here. Some big questions. You're doing what you know you shouldn't do and you keep doing it without repenting and saying, I, I, I don't want this anymore. It's one thing to have a problem and say, God, I've stumbled again. Yes or no? How many of you have had a problem and say, God, I did it again? See? Aren't you glad for God's grace and mercy? Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. Right? Well, here are these people that God loves. Depart from me. I mean, to me, he's almost weeping. Depart from me. Maybe he looks down. Depart from me. Because that's not what he had planned. You get it? So make sure in your life that you cry out and you say, God, I want what you want. And if any part of me is not like you, forgive me and change me. Right? See, God loves us. By grace, you're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, that's the gift of God. Is that good? Not of works, lest any man should boast. I said all that to say this. God's love is available to all of us. But see, the benefits of salvation only come to those who act in faith. Is that true? In fact, I've talked to a lot of people, you know, they say God loves me too much to let me go to hell. Well, he's not letting you go to hell. You let yourself go. Is that true? See, God hasn't sent one person to hell. In fact, he's done everything to keep you out. Because he knows what it's like. His eyes see those folk that are in the flame today. Now, why am I saying that? It's the will of God for us to be healed. I'm 62, I'll be 63 in October. I've been in Jesus September 12th, 45 years. I've had a lot of church members here, uh, people that I've known, Bible school friends, friends in ministry, friends in other churches. I've been part of the staff team all those years. I've had people that I think were better believers than me die of sickness and disease. You say, why does that happen? Well, sometimes you just don't know. Is that true? But every time that happens, and I know the person is a believer, I'm thinking, somehow the connection wasn't made. And I don't always know what that is. Do you? And see, I, I can't judge it, except I know that God has made healing available for all of us. But we've got to get ourselves into position to receive what God has given us. Yes or no? So God loves us, but the only way you receive is by faith. You receive, you receive salvation by faith, right? Then I noticed that God said to Joshua, in Joshua chapter 1, Moses had died. The Israelites had grieved for 30 days. And then God went to Joshua and said, all right, it's time to dry your eyes, blow your nose, and get up. Because you got work to do, Bubba. You're going to lead my people into the promised land, but you've got to conquer city by city. There are Canaanites that live there, and they don't know me and don't like me. 
but I like you and I want you to have that land, but you got to drive them out. I'm not doing it for you. Then he said this, every place that the sole of your foot stands on will be yours. Wow. I'm sure Joshua might have thought, well, I got a lot of walking to do. Right? So healing, salvation, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, God meeting all of your, all of your material needs. I would like to call that prosperity, but that message has been, has been messed up today. And a lot of people in America think that you're blessed if you got a lot of money. Well, you don't know squat. Money has nothing to do with the blessing of God. We got two pastors we support. Am I okay talk? I'm not even on my notes yet, y'all hardly. I knew this would happen. Dog, doggone it. <laughs> we got two pastors in um, southern Ethiopia. You have 12 churches, six churches in southern Ethiopia. And we got two pastors. Now, they're blessed. We pay their salary every month and have for, man, over a dozen years now. Every month. It's, it doesn't take a lot to support them. And, you know, what we give them, they're doing good. They can buy food for the family. One of them's got two kids. The other's a single guy. And, uh, but you know, and, and we've gotten them bicycles. A bicycle there is like driving a, a BMW, Mercedes. Here. You get it? Or a real tricked out truck. You choose. You see, prosperity across the board means God is meeting your needs, whatever the needs may be. It doesn't mean you flaunt it in front of anybody. If you've done that, then you know what? Money's your God. Things are your God. God doesn't care what you have. He doesn't care if you have a lot as long as you don't care that you have it. As long as you're willing to give it away. The moment that you hold on to it, it, become, it becomes your God and takes his place. Anyway, faith. It takes faith to receive answered prayer. A lot of people don't get answered prayer because they don't understand the principles of faith. Now, one thing about faith is God's pleased when we have faith. How many hear me? In fact, I love this. This is a New Living Translation, Hebrews eleven six, 6. And it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely think him, uh, uh, seek him. It's impossible to please God without faith. Y'all, how about say that with me? It is impossible. To please God without faith. Now, see, that, that, that brings a question up in me. Okay, am I pleasing God? Now, and then that brings up another question. Am I living by faith? What does it mean to live by faith? It means you take God's word over what you feel. Uh, living by faith means you take God's word over what other people are saying about you. Yes or no? Living by faith means I'm, I'm taking God's word as the standard for my life, even though it doesn't look like it's working right now. Abraham called himself Abraham, father of a multitude. What's your name? You just come walking down the road. What's your name? Abraham, where's your kids? They're coming. You may look like you don't have what God promised, but you've got to act like you got it till you get it. And if you act like you got it, you got to get rid of the somber face. And you have to stop talking about what you don't have. And you have to stop talking like you don't have it and start talking like you do. And you have to have a disposition that is happy, excited. Because I can't see it or feel it, but it's mine. Now, I've gotten that way. I'll just tell you about our uh, building permit. One day, I'll stand up in front of you and say, we, we have our building permit. For you, those, those that don't know, we've been working for three years, getting a site permit now for what? Since last November, getting a building permit. And I believe I receive. And I'm just thank you. I woke up this morning and said, Lord, in the middle of the night, Lord, thank you for that building permit. I'm so happy. Oh, you're so good. Glory to God. Do I have it? No, not in my hand. Uh, is it going to be? I'll have it one day. My faith's taking the place of it for now. You get it? So you ever walk, wake up and not feel saved? You ever wake up and feel not loved by God? You ever feel unrighteous? 
like you remember all your mess? Maybe you messed up real bad last week. Do you know if you confess your sin is to God just as though you never did it? Is that good? See, walking by faith means what God says means the most to me. Right? Anything can be received from God. Anything we receive from God, number one, is by faith. Number two, faith makes the impossible possible. I love this. Now, I've, I've, gotten, I've, I've written out the scriptures in my notes, but I don't have time to go through all of this and read them. But in Mark 9, here was a, 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 some parents of a boy, and he had some kinds of seizures. Could have been brain seizures, could have been epilepsy. The Bible really doesn't say but, but it was causing them problems and nobody could help them. They went to the disciples for, uh, to be helped. And Jesus discerned that a demonic force, sometimes uh, sickness is as a result of a demonic force, not always. All, all sickness is satanic in origin in that there was no sickness prior to the fall of man. And there is no sickness in heaven. However, sometimes there is a specific demonic force that has to be dealt with. all this stuff that comes up. I was going to see somebody in the hospital. This is over 20 years ago. I think I was in uh, Rex Hospital. I went to pray for this person. Uh, and for whatever reason, they were getting ready for surgery. And, but I remember talking to the family in the waiting room, and the family said, well, you know, it's just really odd. So-and-so has had problem after problem after problem, I mean, it's one right after the other. I mean, you got to take care of this, and then another physical problem crops up, creeps up. Then you deal with this, and then another one. And I talked to the family, prayed with the family, and then walked out. I, at the time, I was doing all the hospital visitation because the church was small. And, uh, but I remember walking out the waiting room on the first floor. You come into Rex, and there's a little waiting area. And then I just turned like I was going to go out, but for some reason, I turned my head. When I turned my head... Here's the man that we were talking about on a, on, a, on a bed, and they're wheeling him to surgery. And when I saw him, I knew there's a demonic spirit messing with his body, causing him to be constantly infirmed over and over. I went to my car, and I said, you foul devil, take your hands off that man. I named his name. You take your hands off of him. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, stop now. Because we have authority over the devil, over demon spirits. Now, I didn't tell anybody I did that. I didn't even tell the family. You'd never know who it is, and it doesn't matter right now. But you know what happened? He went through that surgery. He never had another problem. He got fine. He became fine. And I knew, well, looky there. Looky, looky, Lord. It was a little devil messing with him. Now, here's this little guy here, and his parents, uh, nobody could help them. The disciples couldn't help them. Verse 22 of Mark 9, the Spirit often throws him in the fire of the water, trying to kill him, have mercy on us, help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can, Jesus asked. What do you mean, if I can? I've been walking, y'all watch The Chosen? I can see that character say, what do you mean, if I can? Jesus asked anything, uh, and uh, what do you mean if I can, Jesus asked. And then he responded, anything is possible if a person believes. Is that good? Do you, do you have possibility faith? So question, is it possible that you come out of the problems you have right now? Is it possible that God can get out of you out of that financial mess you dug your whole, you did it yourself? Is it possible that God gets you out of the quagmire of mess that sometimes you create? Is it possible that God can heal you of whatever? Is it possible that God can set you free from a habit you've had all of your life and you've been in his clutches and can't seem like you can? Is it possible? You know, sometimes I just take that scripture right there. All, th any, all things are possible. Anything is possible to him who believes. I think King James is in it. It says all things are possible. To him who believes. Is that good? So, and then I say, you know what? All things are possible with me, Lord, if I'll just believe you, right? And then Matthew 19, 24 through 26, I don't want to read that. 
uh, they were talking about who can get to heaven. And they, Jesus had just uh, talked to a very wealthy young man who basically rejected everything Jesus had to say. And they said, who, who can, uh, and Jesus said, it's easier for an eye, uh, a camel to guy, go through a needle's eye. Now that probably is hyperbole. Some people think there was a small aperture in, in some of the uh, doors uh, going into the uh, uh, the gates of the city of Jerusalem, and they called that small aperture the needle's eye. I think Dake, Dake's annotated reference Bible mentions that. Nonetheless, it says easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person because they trust their, it's too easy to trust your money to enter into the kingdom of God. And then Jesus looked at them and said, humanly speaking, it's impossible. But with God, everything's impossible. Everything's possible. How many believe with God's every, everything is possible? You ever looked at your own life? Maybe you got an ingrown toenail that just won't quit. I'm, I'm talking about get practical, right? Have you ever looked at that and said, you know what? All things are possible with God, and all things are possible to him who believes. So it's possible that just quit aggravating me, right? Or maybe you got stomach trouble. trouble. Or maybe you have uh, stomach problems. Maybe you have respiration problems or problems with ringing in the ear. In fact, somebody's having that problem now. And the Spirit of God is coming on you to heal you from that. You'll come back to me and tell me it left. Father, let the presence of Jesus go into that person and rid them from that because it sure is aggravating to them. Let me hear from them that it left in Jesus' name. Ah. Everybody good? Now, number three, let's see how far I get today. I'm not going to get as far as I wanted to, but this is okay. You can receive healing by faith. I want to read this. This is Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, starting with verse 5, a Roman officer came and pleaded with him, Lord, my young servant lies in bed paralyzed and is in terrible pain. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come into my home. Look at this. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. Wow. You don't have to touch him. You don't even have to come in my house. All you've got to do is say it and it'll happen wherever, wherever he is. Woohoo! Wow. I know this because I'm under authority of my superior officers and I have authority over the soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who followed him, he said, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And I tell you this, many Gentiles will come from all over the world, from east and west, sit down with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, the king, and feast in the kingdom of heaven. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom of God was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, go back home because you believed it's happened. And the young servant was healed that same hour. Whoa, 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 whoa. Isn't that awesome? Jesus calls that great faith. So, you know, I have to ask yourself, do you have great faith? Can you believe that just with the word of command, just, just God has said it and you believe it and it happens? That's great faith, right? And then here's two blind men, Matthew 9, when Jesus departed from there. Two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. Jesus said to them, Do you believe I'm able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Watch this, verse 29. Then he touched their eyes. Now, now you know, that first guy, he just said, You just speak the word. But Jesus said to these blind men, Do you believe I'm able to do it? Oh, yeah. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be to you. Where was their faith? Well, if Jesus just touched my eyes, he met them where their faith was. You know what? God will meet you where your faith is. Huh? And look what happened. And their eyes were opened. Jesus sternly warned them. 
See that no one knows it. Then Mark chapter 5, this is really interesting. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal for, from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Some people don't have any money because they're giving it all to the physician. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. Now, it's interesting that the robe of the priests in the Old Testament had, had these little, uh, had these little uh, things, uh, t- what do you call it? Tassels, thank you, uh, attached to the bottom. A- and it was blue. The blue stood for the word, and the tassel stood for the word. So she thought, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. She touched his robe for she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. Now, you know what the inference is? She grabbed a hold of the word of God. Right? Immediately, the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd asking, who touched my robe? His disciples said, look at the crowd pressing around you. You ask who touched me. There's a lot of people touching you. You've been in a crowd going to a game or something and everybody's, get off me. I mean, they're all around you, you know. Or maybe you're in an airport. I've been to Heathrow Airport in London, I don't know how many times. And you like cattle. And you're trying to get through, you know, trying to get through, you know and uh, inspection and such, and everybody's in a hurry because you don't want that plane to leave your hide in Heathrow, I'll tell you that. But you got all these people around you. Well, here's Jesus. They said, they said, look at this crowd pressing around you. You ask who touched me, but he kept on looking around to see who had done it. See, there's a difference when you touch Jesus with faith. If every person that touched him had touched him with faith, there could have been heart conditions healed, Ear conditions healed, stomach problems healed, bone problems, right? But she's the one that said, purposely said, if I can just touch him, I'll be healed. Well, again, he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell down to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, my power made you well. That is not what he said. Daughter, you're what? You're what? Say it one more time. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering's over. So listen, if her faith can make her well, and she's not even a new covenant believer, can your faith make you well? Now, she wasn't inert. She acted. If you sit there on a, like a bump on a log, waiting for God to do something for you because he loves you, you'll be sitting next year this time. You got to act. And you got to act like you get it before you get it. So number four is, fourth point on this, exercising faith for healing. Determine what you can exercise faith for Without doubting, ask yourself this, what can I believe? Now, I'm not going to take time to go through this because I want to get to my last point today. Can we do that? So there are different levels to faith. If you look at the New Testament, all this is in my notes. There's great faith mentioned by Jesus. We just mentioned that in Matthew 8. There's weak faith mentioned by Jesus. Abraham was not weak in faith when he... Uh, when he when, when he saw that his body was dead, he looked away from his old body to the promise of God. So he, we, what does weak faith do? Considers the circumstance and the circumstance alone. Well, I'm doomed. Well, this can never happen. That's weak faith. Uh, well, strong faith, on the other hand, hand, it doesn't stagger at the promise of God. If God said it, he's going to do it, right? Then there's little faith. There's growing faith. So question is, what kind of faith I ask myself, what kind of faith do I have for God to heal me? Now, I wanted to mention this, and I'm glad at least I got this far today. Number five, start with something small. You're not going to be able to believe for something big until you start believing with something small. You know, uh, I, uh, I can go long distances on a bicycle on the Noose River Trail, 
because I started October of 2012. The first time I got on there, and I've been jogging for 33 years, but it's different. I went about three or four miles, and I was done. I had noodles instead of legs. I thought, well, I'm shocked at myself that this is so tough. But now I can go in excess of, you know, 36, 40 miles. And I'm not bragging, just saying I had to work on it. Yes or no? So, but I started small. I started going four, three or four miles, five miles. You may have to start going one mile. I know years ago, back in the early 80s, uh, God spoke to me about exercise regimen for my personal life. And when I, I'm not very proud to say this, we had a one-mile track that went into some uh, woods and such where, when I lived in Broken Era, Oklahoma, with suburb of Tulsa. And uh, so, you know, I got out there and said, well, I'm, I'm going to run a mile. I got y'all an eighth of a mile, got the proverbial stitch, sat my honey right there and said, whoo, <laughs> And it took me a few weeks, and I remember when I run past the mile marker thinking, Looky, looky, looky at me. Somebody look at me. I went a mile without stopping. Well, I finally got up to five miles in 40 minutes. You're not going to win any world records. But I did get my body in shape, and I found out you just got to keep working on it, right? If I'd have been defeated with an eighth of a mile, I'd never gotten there. So again, start small. Anything in life. Jesus said this, Mark 4, 28, the earth produces the crop on its own. First, a leaf blade pushes through. Then the heads of wheat are formed. Finally, the grain ripens. So he's got first, first the, you know, first the seed, then the blade, and then the head of wheat, then the grain ripens. So it's a little bit at a time. And faith is that way. Start with something that's not life-threatening, believing God for your health. How many understand? Now, you're not, going, you, you're not going to be able to believe, and I'm, I'm just saying I've been doing this for really since 1976. I haven't been perfect at it, but I've been pursuing God and seeking to walk by faith for physical health for all those years. And, and there's certain things I've been doing, and I've had to, it's been a price to pay. And, and I thought, well, I'm willing to do it. And, and I'm glad I did way back when I was young, because now that I'm older, I got the pattern set. Because I know physical challenges come lifelong. But the idea is I started with small things. Ask for some, something that's not life-threatening. If you've never walked by faith in God for healing, I mean, believe God the next time your head starts hurting. Before you reach for the aspirin or ibuprofen, whatever you take. Ask God and, and command it to go and ask God to heal you. Right? Huh? Or a hangnail. Come on, give me a break. You know? Or a rash, or a bump, or, a, or whatever, or a cold, sniffles, cough. You know, if you can trust God in the little thing, it'll grow. How many hear me? That's the way it is. You know, you don't start, you know, running laps when you first start walking. You go with one step, and then you fall. Is that true? Same way with faith. So, you know, make it, make it that practical. And then don't condemn yourself if you're not where somebody else is, and then don't condemn somebody else if they're not where you are. Now, listen to this. For me as a pastor, when I'm talking to people, and I've been in ministry since 1981, I've talked to so many people in hospital rooms, and talked to people who had various illnesses and such. And, and you know, what do I do? No, well, what I do is I want to find out where a person is. I find out what's wrong, what, where the person And then the next thing I want to know is, now, where is their faith? doesn't matter where my faith is. I know the Bible says the prayer of faith, James 5, 14, the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. Who determines if the prayer of faith is prayed? Well, I, the person praying needs to have faith, but more, more decidedly is the person receiving prayer. Yes or no? So this is not a one-size-fits-all thing. Don't be getting on people if they're not where you're at. Hush your mouth. In South Carolina, we'd just say, shut up. I'm sorry if you're from South Carolina. I pick on South. I like people in South Carolina. But you get my idea, right? So you have to ask yourself, what can I believe? Can you believe that with medication, this will go away? That's where some people I've prayed for, that's where they are. I say, well, take it and do what the, do what the doctor said, and let's believe God right there, right? That's where they are. Uh, can you believe that with surgery the problem will be solved? I've prayed with some people. I, I went to talk to people, and I could tell just immediately they need to have the surgery. 
They're not comfortable without. I said, well, you go take the service. And I'll, believe, and I'll pray and believe with them. That's where their faith is, right? Don't try to get, bring somebody up to your level. Find out where they are. That's love. Come on, right? Can you believe the problem will be healed by prayer and faith alone? Let me say this. Rare is the person that'll do it. That's rare. Do you hear me? Yes or no? no you, you're in the top 1% if you'll do that. Now, it can happen, but you got to pay the price. Well, let me, can I get really practical now the last year? Can you believe your, you can leave your house and be safe from COVID-19? Some people haven't left home yet, y'all. Right? Can you believe that without a mask you can stay healthy? See, where's your faith? You get it? Now, now here's the thing. I'll, I'll close with everybody. Okay? Always. I'm gonna stop that clock. I'm gonna throw that clock away. How can you tell where your faith is? Uh, I've got three things listed here. You can believe when you you have inner confidence, when you can smile and be at peace and rest. When you're not nervous and concerned about the outcome. You get it? So if you're nervous and concerned and you're not at peace and rest and you don't have inner confidence, you better get some help. Because faith is where rest is. And faith is where peace is. I'll stop I'll stop, and and maybe I'll start back here. Y'all okay? So let me tell this a little. I think I can't remember if I was told this before, but it's worth telling. So I had been walking with Jesus for uh, 27 years, five months. I have a specific mind. That's just the way I am. Sorry. And, um, and I was on the way to India. And I was on a uh, Delta Airlines flight to Atlanta. My next flight was British Airways uh, to Heathrow Airport. Oh, what's the other airport? What's the name? Gatwick. Y'all were on the way to Gatwick. Is that right? So Sean was with me. He was sitting beside me in the seat. He know he remembers me doing this. Midway to the flight, I felt so, I got summarized. I felt so stinking bad. I just can't describe it. And I thought, man, my belly hurts. So I unloosened my belt a little bit. And I had a muddy, I shouldn't tell you, I had a money clip. I had money around my waist. Because I had to pay for all the ministry in Kathmandu, Nepal, and Calcutta, India in cash. So I had some Benjamin Franklins with me. And I said, man, I got to get really." So I went back to the bathroom, undid my pants and took my you know, belt and took all that off. I said, ugh. And I felt no better. And I heard the Lord say, don't get on the next plane until you know what's wrong. Now, he said it in such a tone that it's like daddy talking to you or your granddaddy talking to you. Now, son, you do what you want to do, but I'm going to tell you right now. You do that. That's how it was. Don't get on the next flight till you know. So Sean sitting beside me. You remember, Sean? I gave him a belt to Sean, said, and it's a belt that you could put money in. Is that the way it was? Or a pouch? Pouch, belt. I gave you my belt. That's really weird. I had to hold my britches up. Anyway, ah, I was really sick and I didn't know how bad it was. So I, didn't, I did what the Lord said, don't get on the next flight until you know what's the matter. Uh, one step off the plane, here's uh, you know, the attendance. And I looked at the woman and said, I'm in trouble. I need help. And she looked at me with a look like, I need to help you now. She put me in a wheelchair Y'all, I fainted the moment she, when she put me in the wheelchair. I fainted. Sean and another lady were with me. And uh, when they came to see me, I said, y'all go. I'm not going on the next flight. Y'all, and they went to, you know, y'all go to Kathmandu as well? I wish I could have went. I never get, get to go there in Calcutta. Anyway, I went to the hospital. My appendix had ruptured. And they put me through the CAT scan machine. He come back and said, sir, you're in, in desperate need of surgery immediately. He said, your entire abdomen has, 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 has sepsis. That's bad. And the doctor later told me 100 years ago, you'd be dead. No help for you. Unless God supernaturally intervened. And uh, so I was sitting there. I was laying there. I was laying on the bed after they had 
that put me through the machine told me what was wrong. My appendix had ruptured and I needed immediate surgery. And I was going in and out of consciousness. They were giving me medicine for pain because it was really, really bad. And, uh, and I was sitting there thinking, now, Lord, what can I believe? Should I have surgery? And it didn't take me long to figure out. And I remember Kenneth Hagin. Everybody okay? I run out of time. Our, uh, Kenneth Hagin was in uh, New York City doing a meeting in 1970. It was in a hotel tail room. He told the story to us students at Raymond many times. He said, he said uh, and my heart began to, he had a heart, he got healed of heart problems, but it came back. And he said to lay down on the bed and it was just awful pain. He told his wife, Aretha, I've got awful, awful pain. And here's what I heard. I remember when, when, when the doctor told me what was wrong with me and I felt how much I hurt. I could hear Kenneth Hagin's voice as he told us students. He said, I knew right then that if God didn't heal me quickly, I'm going to have to do something. And then he said this, because I'm not going to be able to believe God with so much pain to deal with. You can only believe for a certain period of time. And see, that's where I was. So even though I've been walking with God for 27 years, five months, when my appendix ruptured, I made a decision. Cut me open, get that out of me. And I had to believe God that I would be healed of all the poison in my abdomen because it got, it could get in your bloodstream, cause some serious problems, right? So that was really bad. And I spent uh, nine days in the hospital, lost 20 pounds in nine days. I mean, it was just terrible. So anyway, but you know what? It gave me a great respect for the medical, uh, medical folk, doctors, nurses, and those that help. And then my heart is endeared for the rest of my life to my wife because she came up to be with me. So, you know, God can take every negative and turn it into a positive. But I said all that to say, even though I had been believing God for all these years for my physical health, I had to get to a place that I knew where I could rest and be at peace and where I couldn't. And I didn't feel like at the moment that I could be at peace trusting God without surgery. There's no way I'd leave that hospital without having surgery. And I had to believe God that when I went through the surgery, all would be well. So they put me, they were putting, you know, the stuff in the uh, anesthesiologist came up to me. He was a man from another country. He looked over my face like that and said, Mr. Horton. I said, yeah. He said, we take good care of you. I said, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the next thing I know, I hollered out, when are you going to have do my surgery? They said, sir, you're in recovery. You've already been operated on. I said, really? Really? They said, oh, yeah. I said, well, I feel pretty good. They said, there's reasons you feel good. Anyway, does this help you at all? Trust God with the small thing. And don't do anything you're not at peace with. Because faith rests. Faith has peace that goes along with it.